Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this podcast, Michael St Moore Shield talks about his exhibition of photographs of First World War battlefields today, Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace. He picks out some of the images that have a particular resonance for him. My name is Mike St Moore Shield. I'm a photographer. We are here in the Upper College Hall of St Andrews University, where I've been invited by Professor Sihu Strawn to present my photographic exhibition, Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace. The first picture which I'd like to talk about, because it has become quite an iconic picture, not just for me, but for many other people, is what's known as the London Irish football. And no, this is not the Christmas truce football. The Christmas truce football match, there is no primary source. It's a lovely idea, but it is not a historical fact. People probably kicked something about, but there was not a match. But the London Irish football is a historical fact. It's well documented. What happened was that on September the 25th, 1915, the men of the London Irish Rifles got out of the trenches to attack German positions at Luz in northern France, and as they went, they kicked a football. There was a writer present on the day, a man called Patrick McGill, who was an Irishman. He was a stretcher bearer, and his description is, as they go across this, were the men wavering, no fear. The boys on the right were dribbling the elusive football towards the German trench. By the German barbed wire entanglements were the shambles of war. Here I came across dead, dying, and sorely wounded. And I saw bullet riddled amongst the spider webs known as chevaux de frise, a limp lump of pliable leather, the football which the boys had kicked across the field. I think it's extraordinary, the thought of men charging towards machine guns, kicking a football. I'd known about the football because my father served with that regiment in the Second World War. I rang them up and said, do you still have the football? And they said, yes, and I went and saw them. I said, well, by any chance, could I take it back and photograph it on the battlefield? Ah, oh, we see no reason why not, they said. Now, that makes museum curators go white. A hundred-year-old artefact being handed over to a stranger, but they did. And the photograph shows it, if you like, on its home ground a hundred years later. It brought a bit of a lump to my throat when I was photographing it. When you touch that football, you really are touching the men on the battlefield. If we move on to a picture taken in Passchendaele, the Battle of 1917, it's a shell lying there on the ground. It's estimated that probably 25% of the shells that were fired failed to explode. So 100 years later, shells are still emerging, particularly when the fields are ploughed. It's called the Iron Harvest. Now, if one of these shells was found lying around here, all hell would break loose and there'd be blue and white flashing lights. But in France, it's part of life. In 2015, they collected 180 tonnes of unexploded ordnance. That's explosive and gas shells. As you walk around, you will see piles of shells by the corners of fields waiting for the bomb squad to come along and pick them up. This next picture, this is a photograph taken on the Ancre marshes of the Somme. This represents the literary involvement of people in the First World War. It reflects on J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, who was here in 1916. He relived his experience when he described Sam Gamgee, the hobbit, in the Dead Marshes. His face was brought close to the surface of the dark mere. The lights flickered and swirled. For a moment, the water below him looked like some window, glazed with grimy glass through which he was peering. He sprang back with a cry. There are dead things, dead faces in the water, he said with horror. Dead faces. These are the marshes of the Ancre. And we know that if you were wounded and you slipped off the duck boards, which you used to cross the mud, you fell in and that was it. You were likely to drown. The marshes are still there, but it's really rather beautiful. Fields of battle and lands of peace. Now, this next photograph, I was very honoured to be allowed to take this picture because this is almost certainly the last battlefield grave on the Western Front. The body has been removed, but the cross marking where the body was with the soldier's helmet atop is still there. It's Corporate Edward Ivaldi. He is killed in April 1917. 
And there's a plaque there left by his father in 1919, along with parts of his equipment. There's his belt, there's a bit of a boot, there's his bidon, his drinking bottle. At the end of the war, there would have been thousands of these along the Western Front. But this is the last one. It's kept very closely guarded by the French army. I am not allowed to tell anybody where it is. I do feel very honoured to have been allowed to photograph it because this man represents what would have been hundreds of thousands of such men, such crosses, dotted along the Western Front. We British, we tend to look at the First World War, I think, through the letterbox of July the 1st, 1916. A disastrous day, 20,000 dead. Well, actually, if you go back to August 1914, August the 22nd, the French lose 23,000. What we have to think about is what did these men die for? What lessons can we learn? And if we don't learn those lessons, remembrance is pointless. Because what are we remembering them for? Now, this picture here is called the Rabenbuhl Friedhof. This is a German cemetery. When you look at the young soldiers, the Germans, the Austrians, the Turks, whoever the enemy was at that time, many of them were young men doing their duty as they were told by their fathers. So I think we should honor the dead of all nations. The Turks certainly do. There's a famous speech of Kemal Ataturk about whether they're Mohammed or Johnny, now they lie on our soil, they are our sons and we will care for them, which I think is incredibly moving. And very important, because it does show that you can have real reconciliation after the war. These young German soldiers, they went to war full of national pride. And I think we should respect them for what they were, because they were young soldiers doing their duty. This is, I think, one of the most haunting memorials on the Western Front. It's known as the Brooding Soldier. It's a memorial to the Canadian soldiers at Vancouver Corner in Flanders. And this is a memorial to the Canadians who are in April 1915, when gas first was used, they came in and held the line. There's an extraordinary story about it. There was a doctor close to the front lines. He smelt the chlorine gas and realized that the antidote to chlorine was an alkaline. So he told people to piss on the handkerchiefs and stuff them in their mouths. Um, quite a thought. <laughs> gas has become a very emotional thing. But in fact, when you look at the figures of how many men actually died of gas, it's a very, very small number. It shows how our emotions can be swayed. Wilfred Owen wrote those powerful words, gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea i saw him drowning and in all my dreams before my helpless sight he plunges at me guttering choking drowning and this final photograph well this is tynecott cemetery in flanders it's the biggest british war cemetery in the world there are eleven thousand men here and about another thirty four thousand names on the back wall unknown dead. It's one of the few pictures I took where I knew exactly what I wanted to get before I went there. I wanted it to look bare and desolate and lonely because when King George V came here in 1922, he simply said, I have many times asked myself whether there can be more potent advocates of peace upon earth through the years to come than this massed multitude of silent witnesses to the desolation of war.